All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, to start our reading off, uh, Anita, would you like to begin? Okay. I'm going to read two pieces. One is um, goes with this picture that most of you know. That's the first one. And the first five lines of this poem come from Edward Lear. And I'm having a little trouble with my Zoom. So if I go in and out, I'll go in and out. Um, okay. The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. And then a duck, yellow beaked with a sleek green feathered head, luckily a friendly and hardy female pulled us out to another ocean with pirate ships and Peter Pan, Wendy, Captain Hook, and Tinkerbell. Oh, she's frozen. Oh. Mm. We found that if she turns her video off. Warm, one on each side, lavender and sandal breathes in this ocean. Mist, mist with tears, mist in her one piece green bathing suit swimming out, waving to us on the beach where we swing our blue plastic buckets, collecting smooth flat gray stones along the sh um, Anita? Hmm. A lot of times when this happens in the right- Her purple beach towel outspread, coloring the sand. Come back, come back, a little scared with you out there in the deep ocean, two of us alone, come back, now dripping and laughing and wet hugs, safe again and awake now. Twilight comes to shore, the duck swims away to her breadcrumb dinner in the tall green grasses at the edge of the sea, the pesky mosquitoes swarm and bite. We head for home. Thank you. The other piece is called Pathos Pictured. My grandma was an Orthodox Jew, which means covering her head with a plain white cloth she lit candles every Friday night that glowed through the window against the sunset, also maintained a kosher home, observed Shabbat, changed dishes for Passover, kept all the rules. She started her Sabbath day observance by walking the five blocks to the old synagogue with its rust, musty smell of used prayer books, its Torah scrolls wrapped in their velvety covers, men and women separate, men in their prayer shawls, swaying back and forth, back and forth to the rhythm of the cantors chanting and grandma sitting in the balcony with all the women together and there was praying and also gossip about who got engaged, who was pregnant, who was riding on the Sabbath, which was forbidden, also in the balcony, not skinny and even a little bony like my grandma, was plopped my obese great aunt 
Esther who pinched my cheek when I was there and who made the best potato kugel I ever had. All these women of all ages modestly dressed in their small plain hats worn for respect and not for show, and sometimes children running up and down the aisles, so there was occasionally a carnival atmosphere in the balcony. That's how orthodox shuls could be. But the men's section downstairs was more just the hum of praying, and because I was only 10, I was allowed to visit my great uncle Oscar, who also pinched my cheek, who lost a son in the war, but it made him more religious and not less, maybe because he thought he had done something wrong, broken some rule. So that's how it all was before we walked back to the apartment Grandma, mother, and me to have our big Shabbat lunch with grandma's homemade gefilte fish and chopped liver and matzo ball soup because our truce because at that age of 10 I was mad for crayons and coloring books and also Duncan yo-yos, paper dolls, paddle balls that she brought me to and let me snuggle my face into the big fur collar of her cloth coat which was probably fake fur but felt really soft and comforting and we played endless games of casino for penny stakes. And grandma made us keep all the rules, no cheating allowed. But that was when I was older because when I was really little and had both a mother and father, grandma babysat and let me stay up to listen to the hip parade on the radio. And I have these weird filmy memories of our voices singing along to I found my thrill on Blueberry Hill and being tucked into bed. But then when I was 12, my grandma died suddenly of something called a cerebral hemorrhage, which I learned was a sort of a ball of blood that got stuck in her brain. And my mother called the ambulance and they all came in their blue uniforms, but it was too late. And I was sent to a neighbor who told me I had to be strong for my mother and not cry, but I didn't want to be strong. I wanted to cry and cry and cry, which I held in because of what the neighbor said. But then when I saw my mother again, who had been so close to my grandma, phoning her several times a day, and I saw how she was crying. I let mine all out and we cried together, my mother and me, and I felt less alone. But soon after that night, there was the planning of the funeral, which happened quick after the death in Judaism. And my uncles, my mother's three younger brothers, wanted fancy for show a satin lined fine wood coffin, which is not Orthodox Jewish at all because Orthodox Jewish is very simple and basic. Even just a pine box is enough like my grandfather had who died a long time ago. I was named for him and they had flowers there at grandma's lilies and arrangements and a floral wreath, which is definitely not Jewish because Jewish is plain, no flowers, just contribute to some charity. And the very worst thing, an open casket, which is in no way Jewish. Jewish is always a closed cast coffin. So my stricken mother wailed and howled, and my grandma, if she could have, would have wailed and howled. 
but those boys, the doctor and the lawyer and the pharmacist, overruled her, of course, so they could show off a fancy, not really Jewish funeral for their big shot friends. And then the show of the funeral went on and I sat in my purple dress, which my snobby aunt called lavender and sobbed and was told by that same aunt to quiet down and behave myself. So terrified, I watched my bereft and frantic mother throw herself on the coffin until one of my uncles, embarrassed, pulled her away, not gently. So the last time I saw my grandma, all her rules got broken. Wow. 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 Thank you. The power of the long poem. Thank you so much, Anita. Mm -hmm. you brought us a whole world. Wow. Mm. Mm. Emily, would you like to go next? Yes, yeah, sorry, I was adding to the chat. I just <laughs> love that ending, Anita. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll read two poems. The first one is called Atlantic. I see a crab with hook, line, and sinker wrapped around his dominant claw, binding it shut, as if the crab is shaking his closed fist in anger at me for invading his own private tide pool. I reach toward him, hoping to free him from his entrapment, which is the fault of one of my kind, but he snaps his smaller claw at me in warning, reminding me that he is the boss in this small corner of the ocean. We fight with whatever we have left and we refuse help when it's offered because sometimes aid looks like an enemy and we don't recognize healing when it comes to us. Oh God, that makes me cry. That's really great. <laughs> it makes me cry. Thank you. Um, the next one is called, How Do You Like to Spend Your Free Time? I have no tangible hobby. I tinker with tails, not engines. I weave words, not blankets. I don't golf. I go deep into the greens of metaphor. I know you may be into astrology, baking, ceramics, dance, embroidery, feng shui, gardening, home brewing, ice skating, jigsaw puzzles, knot tying, lock picking, magic, nail art, origami, powerlifting, quilting, wrapping, stamp collecting, taxidermy, upcycling, ventriloquism, whittling, yo-yoing, Xbox, or Zumba. But what really blows my skirt up is a notebook, a pen, and the previously unnoticed. What? Oh, that's great. I love that. It's just great. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Green metaphor. I did an interview recently where they asked, you know, like, and how do you like to spend your free time? And I'm always like, <laughs> Amazing. Oh. Walking between the worlds. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who else, folks? Come on up to the plate. Okay, I'll, I'll come. <laughs> I think. Bruce? Okay. Um, moods of Cat and her seas. Cat Island caps Marbleheads Harbor. Always prudent waters and quiet as well. A day after a nor'easter, Chuck, high school kid, took his Novi, open 20-foot lobster boat, out of the harbor and seaward of the island, planning to circle the island and then return home. Chuck's expedition was afoot, even though Chuck's dad had forbade it, said not to take the Novi out at all, not even into the harbor. Under beautiful, comfortable, boisterous, and very windy skies, the seas lifted Chucky and boat 
clear out of the water, the engine props spinning in air, leaving white-faced Chucky in a veil, white veil of terror. Novi and Kid were as airborne as any 747 after takeoff in Boston. The boat descended in an infinity of detail and time, awkwardly, with a sideward slant smashing into the brick hard sea. After multiple flights and crashes, the Novi and Chucky held up, fighting their way back to the harbor side of the island in peace. Later, still decked in the white veil of terror, shuddering, muttering to dad in a timid, small, pale voice, his dad's only comment was, I'm just glad you're alive. <laughs> Fog covers the harbor island and sea, muffling sound of the bell on the buoy. Visibility is zero as the tow boat leaves the harbor with a cargo of children. The island's caretaker raises the captain on radio. You're 100 yards to the south of the landing. Raider says I'm at the landing. It's good we're talking. You were about to dump the kids in the ocean. Head back slowly and try again in 20 minutes. A new moon, a warm, uh, quiet, black, dark summer's night gently blankets the island and sea. An exclamation, a woman as open as a blooming flower receiving her lover. At night, winter's blizzard has grounded an oil tanker at sea just north of Marblehead. The rescue boat Can Do is on her way. The Can Do and her crew were lost within the hour. The crew on the tanker was rescued the next day. Sunny Saturday, in tranquil wind, it's the harbor becalmed. Father and son, it's the son's first time, rowed out into the harbor. Just off the landing, they were fishing for flounder. Dad glances out at the boy and the island beyond. The pair run drop lines over gun gun gunnel. Sinker goes to the bottom, carrying baited hook on a short line to rest on the floor of the sea. Flounder are flat fish, bottom dwelling fish, who live on their side. Strike after strike, 10 fish in five minutes, the boy decides he wants to go home. He doesn't like killing. Most cats have many moods. Cat Island is no different. Wow. Uh, uh, that's Thomas for Lori. I see her sitting there, so sweet and calm, shaping questions to craft poetic blooms. Her students write their lines from lust to psalm, all flowers from a year of springs and dunes. Her eyes join her broadening mouth and smile and speak enthusiastically to her class. Her joy lives honestly for going guile. Trust her, here is one that is never crass. So cool, what do you think? Count me in. Yay, mind altering, lovely. Thank you, dear. Always in the, always in an ancient place, poetic kin. No matter where poets start, they end here. Framing words that surround, I love you, forgive me, I'm sorry, I'll remember you. Wow. Wow, Bruce. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You know what I hear in your voices is that you are trusting yourself so much. These long poems, you're trusting the, the journey of the poem. It's really something. Wow. Wow. You. Thank you, Lori. Oh. You're a magical teacher. Oh, bless you. Are. Yeah. Yes, she is. Bless you, bless you. My head's getting too big. <laughs> who, who would like to read next? I'll go. Wonderful. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, Hi gang. <clears throat> so my first, my first poem is entitled simply, The Mouse. He lay near the tree, color of an aspen leaf, tooth like him who will no longer chew. The search for seeds for beetles dry as dirt is over and the long tunnels under the snow, well, 
that is also past. He looked perfect as a pin, no blood, no tooth of cat. And I thought at first he was asleep, but didn't move when touched with stick. Maybe he envied the birds and climbed the tree, paws more suited for runs than bark, and reaching the highest branch, legs flung wide as wings leapt into the air. What must it have been like, that brief ecstasy, the long fall, the bounce, and then what? A long, slow aching, dreams of seeds and of children, or maybe just lightning and nothing. The ants will find him soon, or the carrion beetles drag him to their pile, gifted for their children. Or maybe the crows with eyes shiny as starlight will find him first, and tearing him into tiny pieces to fit their slackened throats will show him, finally, what it means to fly. Oh. Oh, oh my gosh. God. <laughs> yeah, really. Oh my gosh. Look at that line. What must it have been like, you know, to ask that empathetic question to whatever you experience in life of another life form, you know? What an entry. Oh. Well, thank you. So my second poem, I recently have grown tired of free verse and decided to return to the source, to the wellspring, to the form in which all immortal poetry is written. And of course, <laughs> the rhymed couplet in iambic. <laughs> so this, this poem is entitled, At Last Spring. Hey, before you start, could everybody mute? Yeah, it sounds like the tide's coming in. <laughs> Maybe it is where Bruce is. Yeah, everybody can mute real quick. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. At last, spring. I count them one, two, three, and four. Before I stop, there's five, six more. And standing out in greening yard, I see their colors. It's not hard to watch them sprout out in the lawn like little children being born. There's daffodil and jonquil yellow and hyacinth, that purpley fellow, crocus, bloodroot, white as snow. It will be hard to see them go. I'll turn away, it's not too late. It's been so long I've had to wait to fill my life with vernal hue, but now there's nothing more to do than wait the coming of the ice, the falling leaves, the winter wind that will suffice to drive me through the warming door to take the woolens from the store and put them on before the chill and sit before the fire that doubtless will put me into dreamy sleep. And like the Roberts poem, I will keep the promises of next year's spring Here's what I've learned. Now here's the thing. It never stops this turning of the wheel, the rising of the sun, the jaybird squeal, not even when I reach the final stop, gather in the sheaves, harvest all the crop. There will always be another season that needs me not to find its heart wrong reason. So let me pause, get up the door and go before it starts to rain and hail, before it starts to snow. Oh my so that might be an invitation to all of us to explore that iambic pent pentameter in couplet form. I, it's just unbelievably gorgeous. Ah. Ah. And it does feel like the root, doesn't it? It does feel like a home, that kind of the, the rhythm, the flow, the music. It feels like a kind of home. Our human voice, it just so naturally goes. Good. Glad you liked it. 
You did such a nice job. I know it was your own work, but you did such a nice job reading it and us hearing the rhyme, but not like da 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 da, which I struggle when I read out loud to students. Um, I just thought it flowed so beautifully, Bill. Yeah. Thank you. Man. <clears throat> yeah. I agree. That was just beautiful. <laughs> like a song. Yeah. Makes me want to dance. <laughs> Who would like to read next? Well, I don't have the poems that I sent you, but I have two that I wrote at the beginning of my writing. Wonderful. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Okay, so the first one is called I Shrugged. Down the dark, very wall, I I'm start over. I'm sorry. Down the dark, very hall I walked of wailing pain and perforated wounds. I shrugged. Physiology deduces. Down the dark, very hall I walked of broken bedfellows and burst birthrights. I shrugged. Sociology deduces. Down the dark, very hall I walked of juggled juveniles and jigsaw lives. I shrugged. Psychology deduces. Sophisticated and saturated, I smugly shrugged as down the dark gray hall I walked to my Darwinian discipline and stopped at the open doorway of distinction. Stunned and shocked, I scoffed. Men of stature, meandering as they muttered mindful meditations of a misplaced mustard seed. Mm. And that was the first one. This is the second one. This was, um, I'm going to do something that Mary Oliver always told us not to do. She said, never, you can never explain a point before you read it. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is written to a, um, a girl that mentored me in nursing school. I like Laurie, I'm a nurse or was a nurse. I keep hitting the wrong one. Okay. She told me once that each of us brings a gift of our own to nursing. This is her, hers to Angela. Oblating honor bound, a loving hand for giving forgery and a gentle heart accepting arrogance. She offers a path that souls may journey from darkened depths to evergreen Easters. Surrendering self, steadfast and silent as rain nurtures rivers that it may foster their faster growth. She dams no rivulet that wisdom may flow to feed sap springs of minds. Wistfully wishing a heritage for man not survival and fretful fulfillment, not existence and hollow happiness, but life in charity and character. Her request returns the world to worth. Mm. Such striking lines in there. She damns no rivulet. She was a remarkable person. Yeah. Mm. You know, how many of us have had mentors that we would like to honor like that is, is quite powerful. Mm. Thank you, beautiful. Thank you. She was, is still. I just feel like leaving silence between our work because there's so much to absorb. Would anyone like to go next? I can go next. Is that Heather? Hi. Hi. Hey. Uh, the first poem is called The Sign. The sign in the corner garden says, clean up after your dog, cigarette butts in the can. Overgrown with weeds, this garden is disheveled, a day's work infinitely waiting. We sit with papers, plastic pens, and percolated coffee. The cold metal chairs feel so good in the shade while the temperament of the time is hot sticky and impending. Cicadas sounds slither the air 
30 second cycles of tinny vibrations. The sound starts first at a mumble, then quickly turns to a loud thunderous wave. When it stops, it leaves the air empty. We take sips of our coffee, turn the pages in our books and listen for the sound and for the no sound. Our thoughts ready to put to paper, pens in hand, notebooks in laps. The first prompt begins, the sign in the corner garden says. The next poem is called Adore. I stand on the edge where the yard meets the street. Truck tires spin on slick gravel near my feet. The dust settles, the taillights fade, and in a whisper, you are gone. There is no sound, just the echo of my blood pounding through my ears. I am frozen and, and assaulted by the pain that rips through my stomach, tears up my heart, and causes the tiny fine lines all over my face to tremble uncontrollably. Teardrops trickle down. I gasp for air and begin to hear. Cars roll by in the twinkle of wind chimes. I can see the tall old pines sway on the horizon like an endless sea. I turn to walk back along the cold path, the cold brick path, pull strands of hair from around my damp face. My feet are heavy on rotten porch steps and I stumble past potted plants, permeating with dead leaves. I grip the railing and reach the top. I turn to look one more time up the street I can remember your heavy hands pulling me close and arms wrapping my body so I can feel your heart beating hard against my ear. I close my eyes, tilt my head up, breathe in slowly, and as I exhale, I can hear your soft, warm whisper say, I adore you. Heather, you have such a way of bringing in the whole sensory uh, field. I have to ask you, Heather, is that something that happened to you? It's about heartbreak. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is about heartbreak. Doesn't answer my question, but. Yeah. I mean, it was so real. I thought, how could she write that if she hasn't lived it? I mean, it's just. Yeah, you gave us a feeling that, you know how when things are really hyper real, when you're experiencing a, a trauma or something, you, you have this hyper real state, you brought that. Right, in. right, you really did. I mean, that was amazing and very sad. Thank you. That's so beautiful, you know, in that, in that hyper real, every, every description is just gorgeous. It's like when something like a, like a tragedy hits you, which I've recently been through, you remember every single, yeah. every single moment yeah. like that, just like what you described, you remember it. Yeah. It's, um, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Is there anyone in line behind Heather who would like to read? I have one I can read. Wonderful. Um, I I was I never meant to read this or to share share it with the world, but um, I just suddenly decided I'm going to. And I trust you. Yeah. So I'm challenging myself here. <clears throat> okay. 
I wrote this uh, very early on in, in our class. Doubt creeps in like black ants on a kitchen counter appearing inexplicably from behind the lone avocado, like an outstretched hand waving before my eyes, me, me, pick me, grabbing my attention, pulling me into a game I don't wish to play. I sit paralyzed, my fingers hovering over words meant to be something, meant to be shaped into verse, into succinct tellings of what I see and hear and feel. The flapping laundry distracts me. I wonder if it's cold outside. I wonder if the arms of that evergreen are waving furiously at a barking dog, or if they're meant to turn my eyes from this keyboard Look at me, look at me. I'm lost in distractions. The sound of the furnace jump starting, the lone junco on the bird feeder, the thought of what's for dinner. The sun is setting, I should go for a walk. I should wash my car. Maybe I'll empty the compost. Every thought obliterating my conviction to knit words into verse compose meaning from broken runes, frame significance in a gilded border, a self-portrait displayed with all the others. Oh my God. I love it. Oh, yeah. I like you were that. That was. You know, that's part of the poet's journey, right? It is, 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 as being with doubt, being with those distractions, you just you just nailed that feeling, that experience. And the, and the truth of and, Yeah, and the truth of the experience, every time you try to sit down in silence, something jumps up out of nowhere. I never saw that cobweb before. Wait, maybe I need to go get that. <laughs> 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 that's really good lily thanks thank you the first the first couple lines about the ant that just was so striking wow poet kin you guys are amazing so just to remind people do send me two poems for the chat book that i'm gonna make for you all, okay? Um, who else would like to share? I'll read. Cynthia here. Hello. Hi, Cynthia. Hello. Hi, Hugo. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Uh, let's see. I, I still haven't decided what I want to read. Anyway, okay. <laughs> This is titled Inheritance. Her basement held nothing but the heaviness of fuel oil and rust, the ancient incense of a man's work at a lathe. The cloying damp feeds on tin, sorry, on thin metal cans that leak camphor vapor and peels the paper labels on jars of dark juice dated in a delicate script two generations ago. Fetid and once forbidden, hollow and vacant, three steps down, the tunnel leads underground to the imagination of a child. Her house held nothing but the heaviness of a hoarder's burden the dusty incense of a woman's solitary life. Gifts purchased, then lost, projects begun and given up, junk mail piled and waiting to find value, newspapers piled and unread, plastic containers that might be useful, dried tubes of paint, stacked opera librettos. Memories in closets and boxes, once alive and necessary, now vapor, lead to questions unanswered. Oh, 
just look what you did with that. Leaves me wanting to hear what the question was. Want to hear what? You said the last line of the poem oh. lead to questions unanswered. Mm. Leaves me wanting to know what the questions were. The questions of her life. What was she? What was she asking? That was very good. Just the incense of a woman's solitary life. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. And this one, um, this is what my longing looks like today. <clears throat> to leave behind the gravity bound life of weight and impact, to be embraced so tenderly by the warm water. Gentle surges rock me, sun warms my back, nearly effortless motion. A speckled ray descends, flutters sand over itself until it disappears. Hundreds of silver blue flashes School passed, separate to go around my hand, then regroup. A chin jutting barracuda slips past on its own mission. A reclusive octopus invisible in its camouflage gives itself away when it shifts an arm. Purple, red and tan fans sway languidly while brilliant blue tangs dart in and out. Turtle glides down to feast on seagrass fringes. Oh, to return to life in the sea, to swim, roll, dive freely, to flick my tail, hitch a ride on a passing whale, or let my body rest, just rest in the gentle arms of Salacia. Cynthia. Mm. So I imagine you all heard that prompt in that poem. This is what my longing looks like today. Gorgeous. Thank you. Oh. The title, the title came after I wrote the poem and I realized, oh yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. I can't wait to write to that poem. Thank you. Lovely. Who's up next, folks? These are just incredible. Wow. Petrified Hi, Oh. Sorry. Jim, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, well, I didn't have time to go through my recent poems, so I'll read a couple of older ones. Great. Um, they both uh, come from my more rural days before uh, my wife and I moved to Burlington. So they uh, represent a different kind of life and they're both, they both involve chickens. <laughs> the first one is called Evening Chores. I shut the hen house door with my hip, holding in my left hand two eggs still warm, and in my right the cold claws of a hen who's expired of old age. My chores finished for the night. And then the other was written for my wife when we were celebrating our 25th. We're about to celebrate our 40th. So this is, you can age it from that. It's called Beneath the Bird Feeder. The match pair of Polish white-rested chickens 
I'm sorry, I'll start again. The matched pair of Polish white crested chickens forage beneath the bird feeder, scratching, then pecking, feeding on seeds, the scraps dropped by their wilder kin. Sophia the hen, head down, scavenging, scavenges, sorry, scavenges intently, while Zonker, her rooster, keeps watch, picks occasionally at his own lunch, then struts to his right as if to challenge the wind, and plumage a stream belts out his proclamation to the universe. Good. Ah. Good. I love that parallel of the chickens and your, you and your wife. Yeah. Terrific. It's so nice to have poems from that other life, you know? Who is up next? Thank you, Jim. Um, <clears throat> I'll go. Great, Ellen, hi. Petrified. <laughs> You're inside now. <laughs> I'm inside, yeah. Well, there are two little girls next door and it was getting loud. <clears throat> uh -huh. Unfortunately, because it was beautiful sitting out there. Yeah. Uh, this one's called Waiting It Out. <clears throat> Excuse me. These were not written in the class, but during this time period, um, which you said was okay. Of course. <clears throat> waiting it out implies the future and holds the faith. What do you do when waiting it out? Pace and sigh or begin the new way before it arrives. Forego plans, open to the next way, completely unsure with all unsaid is obedience and why not? And the other one is rapid and slow. New beginnings arrive slowly, rearranging what you've known with a new Unknown becoming now known. Unfelt, now felt. Rapidly seeing into yourself. Rapidly door after door swings open effortlessly once you are willing to not will. Slow to acknowledge you're not who you were. Mm -hmm. You're not who you are. Slowly experiencing fully who you are. New eyes see into the heart of the matter. Seeing into the heart, slowly seeing out through the heart, breathing through the heart, the breath of true compassion where there is nothing to fix or comment upon, just seeing and feeling, breathing, seeing, feeling, heart breakthrough. That was wonderful. Astounding. Thank you. Oh. What was that called, Ellen? Oh, I just closed them. Uh, New beginning? Ellen, rapid and slow is one of rapid them. Rapid and slow? Wait. <clears throat> Will you be sure and send that second one you wrote? Sure. Seeing into the heart. Seeing into the heart. I would love to see that. That's. No, wait, that's that was rapid and slow. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now and then? Wait, I don't have my glasses. I, I'm, I'm so bad at using computers, it's not worth waiting for. <laughs> well, just send them. Okay. Chat book. You know, when you get your chat book, there'll be plenty of lines to write to also write to from your poems here. I mean, there's just so much to drink in and to and to write from. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, Wow. I remember in um, high school, <laughs> having um, studied E.E. E. Cummings and writing a poem that had to do with the picket fence, because as she was talking, I was just going through the alphabet and just like the way the T could look like a picket fence, you know, so 
so I did that. I wrote Picket Fence and there were about, you know, 15 T's. And since then, I've really liked doing that kind of line break thing, which I did in one of those, you know, just, cool. you know, for the slowness of it or. Cool. It's a fun thing to play with line breaks and playing with your letters and spelling and so. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The gift you all give to all of us by your reading is is at any time you feel nervous, just you're you're giving us such a gift. Mm. Who else would like to share? And I hope you get back to your poetry soon. I mean your pottery soon. I'll I'll go. Hi there. Hi. Um, Hi. I just want to say that I've been pretty stuck lately and uh, that I want to be with you guys this way. And so I just kind of scratched a couple of things out this morning and Yay. that's it. Okay. I love it. Um, way to go. Yeah, and not, and neither of them have names. I muster my heart to walk up the steep hill Darkness threatening, scary faces appear in the dark. I keep walking through the threat. Light touches, light touches push me forward. A man beckons me, big smile, wild long hair. He points up past him. He says, there's a bike. He says, it's yours. Time to leave this place. I jump on and ride. A word behind me, and I know he is there riding too. Away, away we go, where things can be. Ooh. Okay, here's the second one. The UPS guy always wears shorts all winter long. He loves the dogs who run into his truck. He sits on the step and pets them, gives them the biscuit they wait for. They kiss him. He stops, even though the clock is ticking. He gives himself what he needs, this moment, simple. I stand there, watching, all my fears leave. He tells me this is his favorite thing of his day. Also's poems felt so zen-like mm. and like they arrived and you took us to these places that, I mean, amazing. Mm. Thank you, Lori. I love how you didn't write all this connective tissue around it. You just stated, you know, kind of simply these things. And it just, it just was so powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. These are all so different, so different. Incredible. Who would like to go next? <clears throat> Do I have anyone to go next? Joe? I think I'm just looking at the participants here. We got Joe, would you like to read? Um, so let's see. I would like to share my screen. Would someone like to read the Renku? Which is amazing. Here we go. Would anyone like to read it? 
Did you all have a chance to read it? I'll read it. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to read from my paper though, so Okay. It's easier for me. Sleepless, oh sorry, moonrise. Sleepless in Vermont, full moon round as a doorknob. Light like no other. Birds wake startled and confused as if the sun never left. And I too awake. Veiled images form and fade, dancing through shadows. Yeah, sorry, dancing through shadows cast by dream clouds, reminders of the last winter birth spring. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not getting the rhythm of that one, sorry. I, and I too awake Veiled images form and fade, dancing through shadows cast by dream clouds, reminders of last winter's birthed spring. I too yawn awake, remembering that morning when all was bleached white, the trees growing layers of snow out of limbs like gloved fingers. So unlike the view outside my rain-streaked window, tulips rebirthing. Vibrant oranges, reds, yellows, and whites perched on tall, shiny green stems. The ringing chorus, frogs know it is their time. Sing hallelujah. Baby leaflets tenderly open the page to a new story. Dripping skies falling, dragging down dead feelings. Glum faces turn upward, waiting for a light to rise, turning them to joy. Spinning me around like the wind stealing blossoms from the red bug tree. A perfusion of pink, flushed cheeks and feverish, waiting to be asked. Heat rises full tilt, overriding clear-eyed mind immediately. The truly true has nothing to do with thinking. Limbic mind feels, loves. Don't think about it. You already know you love. It's the heart of the mind. Oh, sorry, it's the mind of the heart. Patient, the heart waits, unaffected by the rain. Love welcomes us in. Raindrops fall upon calm water above the chute, not knowing their fate. Here, borrow courage. Take this jacket made of stars. From here, there's no map. <clears throat> Mist obscures the stars. Humble heart reads my compass. Trust takes my hand. Breathing in night skies, clouds part mysteriously. Orion revealed. Mighty Orion clouded breath of the night sky, the hunter's namesake, visible to the whole world, you bring me inspiration. You bring me inward, the clouded world parts there too. Here, hermit thrush sings, look. Isn't that amazing? Yes. It is amazing. Will that be in the chat book? Yeah. Oh, goody. I just love doing that. I just love it. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Lovely. Thank you for reading. Yes, yeah, thank you. So i just ask again, would anyone like to read anything?
I suppose I will stop the recording at this point. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.